So we'll continue where we left Hello. before. Hi, Ashu. So uh, we'll continue where we left off before. <clears throat> Here is a, a case hot off the presses from today. Uh, Jennifer, uh, what do you think of this case? Remember, we're talking about uh, AC injuries. Um, so it looks like he'd had a coracoclavicular ligament repair, so there's some metallic susceptibility artifact. Um, and so, so that was, he had the repair three months ago. One week ago, he had a lifting injury. He's had pain since. Okay. Uh, so, what do you think is the cause of his pain? Yeah, here I. I can't see the AC joint very well, or although it seems like there's some fluid within the coracoclavicular interval adjacent to that repair, so I'm concerned that he may have torn his repair. There's an axial damage there. Yeah, here I don't see the coracoid connecting with the glenoid. He may have fractured the coracoid process. What makes you think he fractured the process? Um, I can't see where it connects with. Uh, so what would you the scapula. Um, just some addition. I'd like to look at the additional images to make sure the coracoid process is intact, and he may also need a CT. Okay, so it looks like there is a fracture through the coracoid process. It's but. So, so this is. This is the tunnel through the clavicle. This is the tunnel through the coracoid, but we have to look at it on all the planes. Here's an axial image through that. Okay. To me, this looks like it could be a fracture. Um, the margins are irregular and they're not cortic corticated. Yeah. Yes. Here is actually the drill hole right here. And here we can see the fracture extending both anteriorly and posteriorly. Hmm. That's what I don't like that procedure. I don't know what they use here. Um, some some kind of a device uh, with a tape, probably. Probably, and I know this is this is the one of the most common complications of this surgery. Why a lot of people will not drill holes for the coracoid. They'll put tape around the coracoid and then try. Yeah, and then you take a suture passer and you can go right around it. And uh, that's the best way to do it. Um, I, I don't know what, who this fellow was or why he did this particular. It's an accepted procedure, but uh, this is one of the problems. I, I never did a single one of these. Um, I, I just didn't, didn't like it. Okay, uh, uh, let's see. Ashby, what do you think of this one? <clears throat> um, just looking at a uh, coronal view here. Um, just on this one slice, I don't really see much. Yeah, we're, we're, um, we're cartilage disease. Okay, okay. <clears throat> okay, well, there is a uh, full chondral defect of the superior medial humeral head there, but... <clears throat> So that's uh, right. and uh, yeah, should you should be able to see able to see the cartilage all the way around, and that was uh, an acute traumatic cartilage defect. Michael, what do you think of this case? Michael, sorry, I forgot to turn my mic on. Um, so I see increased signal in the central glenoid cartilage. I don't know if that's the real. Um, that looks like there's probably, you know, maybe a full thickness defect there. Yeah, uh, we can see on other sequences. What about the, the humeral head articular cartilage? The humeral articular cartilage, at least superior, also looks thin, but I couldn't tell if that's just how it's windowed. Yeah, where the arrows are. Okay. Like there's probably a large defect there as well. Okay, so what's the next thing you do when you see a possible defect like that? Well, then you look down in the inferior joint capsule, and I think that's a piece of cartilage floating there. 
probably that popped up. Yeah. yeah that's, that's cartilage. And there we can see it yep. in that inferior recess. Good. Okay, so here's two coronal images of the shoulder, and I also see a linear fragment in the axillary recess, which could be a chondral fragment. Um, and here it is again on the sagittal images and axial. Yeah, so there along the inferior aspect of the humeral head and adjacent glenoid, there's full thickness chondral loss. From, from the glenoid. Okay, so what do we move on to inflammatory disease? We can see what rheumatoid arthritis looks like in the shoulder, bursitis, infections, and some of these other, other diseases. So, Ashu, what do you think of this case? It's a bit subtle, I'll admit. Yeah, <clears throat> looks like diffuse synovitis. <clears throat> Um, with a large joint effusion, um, and uh, <clears throat> I don't know if there's, a, 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 yeah, it just looks like a lot of thickening of the synovium there, a lot of soft tissue thickening, a lot of edema, capsular edema there, and <clears throat> I don't know, this looks like an inflammatory arthropathy. Yeah, there was a couple, some erosions. Some cartilage loss as well. I don't remember if there were any definite erosions. <laughs> But this was a patient who had well-documented rheumatoid arthritis. Michael, what do you think of this case? Okay, so 18-year-old male. So, I mean, when you look, look, there's a large joint effusion with just marked diffuse synovial thickening. Okay. Um, and it all enhances, like that's all just very large synovial uh, Panis or something. So, so I assume this is an inflammatory arthropathy, like, and it looks like there's an erosion maybe in the humeral head. Yep. So you know, I think rheumatoid arthritis or something. This patient went on to an arthroscopic synovectomy. That's not really the usual indicated stay in age. And this this yeah. is arthritis. Got it. So John, do you want to talk to us a little bit about uh, synovectomies? That, that used to be a, a fairly common procedure in the 70s. Um, we, we, we found out, however, that, um, that they, the treatment lasted maybe a couple of months or a couple of, or maybe even a year or, or, or so. It, 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 it was um, very hard to uh, um, get rid of um, every bit of, bit of synovium, it would just grow, grow right back. Um, but um, I remember pre-arthroscopy -arth days, um, when, we, when we did open um, uh, synovectomies, uh, um, we would peel the synovium off. It, was, it, it looked like um, it's, it's, it's hard to hard to describe uh, uh, the panis over the bone um, and over the cartilage and no cartilage uh, with holes around it. Uh, it, 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 it ugly looking stuff. Yeah, okay. And, uh, um, but the, it um, the, the, pe the the folks would have some relief for a while and uh, that that was about it yeah and uh, we'll have lecture on rheumatoid arthritis the treatment is really a <laughs> medication predominantly as long as you know. yeah, uh, our medication uh, was um, steroids and uh, uh, aspirin okay uh, let's see Jennifer so here we can see regions of full thickness chondral loss along the glenohumeral joint. There's cyst formation and osseous erosion and a large joint effusion. So this could be 
Yeah, that's the edema. It could be another case of inflammatory arthropathy, arthropathy or end stage degenerative disease. Diagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis in many years, but it's great job. A degenerative disease, um, you get more hypertrophy in places and osteophytes, etc. Uh, this, uh, I wouldn't, Jennifer, I don't think this would be my first guess. Yeah, so this was uh, uh, in terms of osteoarthritis. Jennifer, what do you think this is down here? See some enlarged lymph nodes, axillary lymph nodes. <laughs> oh, okay. This looks like synovial panis formation. So this, was, this was chronic rheumatoid arthritis for, for many years with a, a lot of that pass formation, and these are rheumatoid nodules uh, uh, adjacent to the joint space there. Ashi, what do you think of this case? So um, two coronal images. Um, we see uh, this is three years post-surfing uh, injury. Um, I think there's some synovial thickening in the axillary recess um, and also superiorly um, in that joint. And then looking here, oh, yeah, there's pretty extensive synovial um, thickening throughout. And there's some um, there's some chondral loss at the glenohumeral articulation as well, um, anteriorly. Um, oh, yeah, this, this looks like an inflammatory arthropathy, although, yeah. This rheumatoid arthritis, and there's it's common for people with long-standing rheumatoid arthritis to uh, lose their articular cartilage, and there are a lot of theories behind it. One of which is they believe that the biochemistry of the synovium in rheumatoid arthritis is abnormal, so the chondrostats don't get the normal nutrition that they need, and therefore uh, don't uh, fare very well uh, over time with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, this, these are chronic cases. You know, hopefully you, you'll never see these in practice anymore, but unfortunately you probably will. Uh, but the, now, as opposed to when I was at your stage, uh, where there was not good treatment for this, now there's very good treatment that uh, is a very effective against most people with rheumatoid arthritis, and we'll talk about that in a future lecture. Okay, uh, Michael. Okay, um, so adult with long standing shoulder pain. So you see areas of increased, kind of focal areas of increased signal in the humeral head medially, as well as some cysts in the anterior humeral head. You can also see joint effusion with pretty significant synovial thickening in that posterior joint. Yeah. So uh, what I'm thinking this may be is um, the, is that actually like synovial panis extending into the humeral head? Well, th this is erosive rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah, like it erodes into it, and the cysts are actually, they're actually like panis or synovium. Yeah, it's synovium that goes in. Well, uh, we'll talk about some of the theories as to why you get geodes or subchondral cysts or subcortical cysts in rheumatoid arthritis uh, in future lecture. Uh, uh, not everybody with rheumatoid arthritis gets erosive disease. An erosive disease is, or the, the osteitis associated, tends to be better treated with the expensive uh, uh, biologic uh, agents, uh, whereas often you can get by with less expensive uh, agents if you don't have the erosive disease. A lot of increased fluid signal intensity in the subacromial bursa with synovial thickening. I'm not sure if this could be a bursitis or inflammatory arthropathy affecting the bursa. Yeah, lots of fluid again in the subacromial and subdeltoid bursa. Bursitis. Subacromial subdeltoid bursitis. And, and I think most of the Scopositis, as we see, are probably more mechanical. It's thought for a long time it was due to outlet impingement, which we've all we've talked about many times. 
and it's kind of a mechanical irritation. It has to always be concerned about infection because uh, this uh, area can get infected and you can get bursitis from that. And then from the uh, other traditional inflammatory diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis can also present with subacromial bursitis. Okay, uh, Ashu. So this is a 34-year-old female with increasing pain uh, seven months after rotator cuff repair real infection. <clears throat> and we can see a lot of um, fluid within the subacromial so subdeltoid bursa, a lot of capsular edema. There's also diffuse synovial thickening um, in that inferior recess. Um, there's there's some, I want to say some erosive change of that humeral head. I don't know if that's just post-surgical change of that humeral head on the uh, ax. Um, yeah, right there. Um, so what do you think is going on here? Um, given how extensive... Yeah, and the rotator cuff repair. Uh, given how extensive the um, the capsular edema is and synovial thickening, I'd be worried about infection. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's to be concerned about. You don't see a lot of really edema of the capsule, and we'll see some infections later. If it's really rip roaring with the typical traditional bacterial infection, you'd really expect a lot of edema uh, outside and around the capsule. Uh, but absolutely, you've got to worry about that, and you've got to rule that out first because that's really a medical emergency. But uh, Yeah, otherwise rheumatoid, yep. Yeah, this was a patient who also happened to have rheumatoid, and just remember there have, there have been quite a few professional athletes over the last couple of decades where we've made the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. So just because you're a young person and active doesn't mean you're not going to get rheumatoid arthritis. So... Uh, you, you will see it if you do a lot of musculoskeletal skeletal imaging. John, were you going to say something? Um, I was going to say that um, when you do repairs on rheumatoid arthritis, um, and, and the tissue is not normal, and, um, and, and it will tear um, easily. And... Um, it, it's uh, uh, you get problems just like what you're looking at here. This is probably something uh, before the drugs came around to treat the disease. Um, I would think, uh, and um, um, you have a recurrence of the uh, rheumatoid uh, arthritis. They probably did a cyanobacterium. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. you get a lot of bleeding and so on. Um, I, I used to hate to repair uh, rheumatoids. Uh, and excision uh, used to be um, something that we used to do um, on, on feet and joints um, and silastic replacements, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to silastic replacements. So a, anyway, um, I just wanted to mention that that's the time. Difficult tissue to deal with, um, and then uh, with, uh, and this is what uh, the result is. Great, not uncommonly. Uh, is Michael next? Michael, in fact, b before you start, there, John, uh, there's a book um, that I put on the shelf there, uh, and, and um. In your uh, next year office, uh, where you guys read the, yeah, the MRIs and 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 uh, on rheumatoid arthritis uh, surgery, uh, you might look at it. And you might find it interesting. Good. Okay, Michael, chronic shoulder pain. Okay, so I see this kind of bony protuberance extending off the undersurface of the scabula with a significant amount of like soft tissue edema. It's kind of heterogeneous in a way along the like ribs, kind of in the scapulothoracic junction. Okay. So I don't know if that's just some, you know, I don't know if that's just some chronic bony protuberance or some congenital type thing, which is now causing all this uh, kind of reactive edema. 
in the region? If you saw this in another bone, what would you call it? In approximately if I saw it. I guess this could be like an inchondroma then. I mean, not inchondroma, osteochondroma. Yeah. Yeah, this was. I didn't know oh, that's, that's weird. Created scapular thoracic bursitis due to the mechanical irritation there. Yeah, I think I probably said this before, but Philip Tierman was the first uh, radiology fellow at uh, Cottage Hospital. All right. So this is a 33-year-old male, four weeks after the flu shot, and there's this diffuse edema in the kind of the surgical neck of the humerus. Normally it shouldn't be that deep, but maybe he does develop some type of inflammatory reaction where he had the flu shot. They, they Oh. They went ahead and treated it with antibiotics, but this was probably an inflammatory response to the to the shot. The infection. But it does, it does look to like it hit the bone though with the needle, yeah. um, and, and that's not quite the place where you're supposed to put the needle. <laughs> that's right. Uh, and 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 um, I don't know whether you've seen more of these uh, cases since um, the, the drugstore started uh, injecting people. Uh, well, I, I've been, I, I just got this one from Frank Sherkovich from Denver. Okay, uh, Ashu. So we have um, a lytic a well-defined lytic margin lesion within the uh, humerus, uh, prox um, proximal humerus there at the humeral neck. Um, looks pretty cystic on the T2s, but it's high in signal. Is this the T? Is this T1 as well? This is. Uh, uh, this is probably T2, and this is PD facet. PD. Okay, so it's cystic. Um, so it just could be a. Just a solitary bone cyst or unicameral cyst. Um, is, is, that, is that a humeral neck? Yes. I'm gonna pick. I'm picking on you. Uh, yes. <laughs> no, no, it's a surgical uh, neck. Oh. Okay. Uh, <laughs> just have a little fun with you. to a case in surgical and uh, anatomic, yeah. Uh, so now notice that there is sclerotic change around this. If you have a just a common run-of-the-mill bone cyst, uh, they tend to be, uh, you tend not to get sclerotic change around it. And if you look on the MR scan, you can see that there's a lot of thickening and signal loss in the trabecular bone around this. And notice that the wall is kind of thickened here. And then if you also look at it on the T2-weighted images, it's not really uniform and high signal intensity. It's really kind of a modeled signal intensity here. And here we can sit in this location. And, and this is a pretty typical Brody's abscess. Yeah. Typical location. And again, they occur in uh, the metaphyses, usually kind of adjacent to the the growth plate or the or the scar from the growth plate, that's where the end arterioles are, and it's thought that that's where the bacteria will get caught and the small capillaries and set up shop when you have a bacteremia. Okay, Michael, what do you think of this case? Six-year-old female with fever and shoulder pain for one week. Um... I mean, what exactly am I looking at? This is a big area of, you know, increased signal, I think, where the humeral head should be. Well, we're, uh, we're posterior to the humeral head here. Posterior to the... I mean, I can't really tell exactly where we are. Right. Um, okay, so there's this, uh, like you said, there's this big area of uh, kind of fluid signal 
and the soft tissues and as what so so here's t1 yeah notice how and it looks like it's got like a rim with some fluid in it so i'm like worried about like an abscess yeah, so notice it's not thin wall. This is really thick wall no. with a lot of sigmoid homogeneity within it. And we can see here it looks like very thick, thick walls on the same yeah. one. And this was a, a staff edge. Okay. We have a 62-year-old male with shoulder pain for 10 days, and we have some coronal, coronal and sagittal images of the shoulder um it looks like these are pre and post contrast there's some enhancement surrounding the supraspinatus muscle um so it probably some myositis i'm not sure if he has any fewer all of that's a supraspinatus muscle and Oh, there's some, okay. Um, is this just um, in bursitis with infection? Yeah. Bursitis, and they just got pus out of this when they went. Cashew. All right, you have two. Um coronal images of patient of shoulder pain, you can see that there's a tear of the supraspinatus um, right there. Um, so this is on 311. Okay. Maybe 311, so you had a big tear. Here's mm -hmm. 11, Okay, so they, they said they did cuff repair, but um, I think there's a re-tear of the cuff construct and you still see the retraction, but there's also a lot of edema at the acromioclavicular joint. Um, and there's also some edema at the suture anchor. Um, I don't know if that's enough. I'd have to scroll through that there, yeah. Let me just go back to um, 311. Presumably had surgery within about a month of this. And mm -hmm. this would be a few months later. Um, yeah, I'd be, well, well, it looks like a lot of it, a lot of fluid at the, uh, within the humeral head at the, the, the hardware part um and, and there's some synovial thickening so I, yeah i'd be worried about an infection yeah that's that, that, with surgery that's the first thing to think of um at least as as a surgeon that's the first thing to think of fortunately in orthopedics um um you see less than one percent or it should be less than one percent if there's more than one percent infection in, in, in orthopedic surgery, then the hospital has a problem. Right. Uh, then you see that in county hospitals, um, and then they, they go up as far as three to six percent. Uh, VA hospitals used to be like that. I don't know if they are anymore. Okay. But um, that, that that's um, when you see a certain uh, when you see an infection in orthopedics, uh, you. It's a problem for the patient, of course, but uh, uh, a problem with the hospital and the, and the surgeon, uh, or can be with the surgeon. Um, I knew a surgeon that when I was a, a resident of UCLA, um, the chief resident, I, I, I put a guy on suspension, um, but um, the chief, chief was away and um, uh, they used to play cards together, and uh, on, on Fridays, uh, a well-known well orthopedic surgeon was a lous lousy surgeon. Uh, I'm not going to obviously use any names, but uh, he had an infection rate that was worse than all the surgeons put together in in, in L.A. Probably. Oh my God! Okay. Uh, I'm I'm not um, exaggerating. Okay. All right, so this is arm pain after surgery, and we can see a total shoulder prosthesis, and you can see that there is an ossific fragment along the inferior glenoid, so I'd be concerned about a glen fracture of the glenoid rim. This is a follow-up from 
Okay, so we can see multiple calcified loose bodies surrounding the prosthesis. And yeah, yeah, the bones sclerotic and mottled and irregular. Um, some type of reaction. Typically, they treat with six weeks of IV antibiotics, but sometimes they'll they'll actually put in reservoirs of uh, antibiotics as well that has to be removed then when you go back and redo the surgery. Ashu. Um, so this is a weightlifter severe pain after weightlifting. Um, Trying to see the abnormality. Okay, some swelling, indistinct fat pad. Okay, I can see that now. So. Oh, and multiple steroid injection. Okay, so we're worried about um, if you're getting a steroid injection, it could be infected as well. And here's the MR scan. Okay, um, so there's two coronal image at the level of the biceps tendon um, moving in intraarticularly. You see a lot of fluid and thickening, I think, um, just yeah, right there. Um, I think that's just, you know, that could just be an abscess. Okay, this was interpreted, not, not a red mat, this was interpreted as a rotator cuff tear. And so the patient was uh, uh, being followed at this point for a rotator cuff tear and had increasing pain. And uh, at this point, then the patient was admitted to the hospital. And, and this was a scan. Well, um, it's must, much worsened, um, uh, large fluid collection now, going both anterior and, and posteriorly, um, uh, a lot of synovial thickening there. Um, yeah. Actually, the way this worked out, I, I guess, so, is that, so I was asked to review this scan, and I said it looked like it was an infection. And uh, so I called the doctor, and the doctor wasn't immediately available. He called me back saying that, Say so the patient came into his office, uh, was very septic. They rushed him to the hospital, and uh, and uh, at the hospital he had worsening mental status, and they actually afraid that he was going to die. But they then uh, uh, went back, tapped this, it grew out Staph aureus. They put him on antibiotics. So uh, yeah, just and if you go back, this just. This doesn't look like any of the scans that we've done in people who just have uh, rotator cuff tears. Uh, uh, this wasn't a tear, even if it were. But if you notice this, whenever you see typical rotator cuff tear, you can see fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, but you'd never see thickened walls like this. Uh, you never see this kind of inhomogeneous signal intensity within it. This is actually a T1-weighted image. On a T1-weighted image, the fluid is always really uniformly low in signal intensity. The margins are very sharply defined, uh, especially on the T2-weighted images. Uh, <clears throat> and this really looks angry, aggressive, and, and very worrisome. And this was Steph Harris. He ended up doing fine eventually on antibiotics. Okay, uh, Michael. Three weeks increasing pain. Um, so I noticed a few things kind of around the joint on the PD facet. There's these like either fluid collections or synovial thickening kind of inferiorly there and inferior to the inferior capsule. And then there's the signal within the supraspinatus itself, which looks a little weird because there's not really a it's almost like either intramuscular tear or fluid collection. And then there's increased signal within the lateral aspect of the humeral head as well. So just notice. Um, I, so this is, this is telling me there's some weird type of inflammatory yeah. process going on. You just lose the soft tissue planes here. Yeah. Whenever you see that, the first thing you have to think about is infection. Mm -hmm. That's all the, all the edema about it. So that's three weeks of increasing pain. <clears throat> 
here's another image a little bit more interior and so now it looks like we're getting some little little artifact which i'd be afraid might be gas like a gas performing uh a gas forming infection he's had no surgery and yeah so i'd say okay now you can definitely see little foci of gas within the collection so this would be almost unequivocally infection and abscess formation in phlegmon and this is clostridia yeah, probably, yeah, yeah, it's just one of the things you have to worry about. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, um, I've seen a few cases. They're they're, they're miserable. Yeah. Okay. A fifty-nine-year-old male with right shoulder pain. Three years ago, he had a rotator cuff repair, and then he had a retear of the rotator cuff and allogenous graft and now he has worsening shoulder pain mm. yeah it looks like there's a fluid collection and debris kind of along the posterior shoulder joint as well as in the region of the supraspinatus, I don't see the supraspinatus that may be torn. Um, I'd be okay. So this is December nineteenth, two thousand eleven. That's post op, isn't it, John? This is. Let me see if I can read it. This is okay. So this is pre op, eleven eight eleven. Okay. Here is post op, twelve nineteen. Okay. And then this is the the second one here. Okay. So this is 12 19, 11. Now we're on 3 27 2012. Okay. So, in a fairly short amount of time, um, you can see just a lot of fluid edema along the medial humeral head and osseous destruction, cortical destruction, and depression where that prior allograft was, and also fluid and debris, thickened fluid extending along the posterior joint. So I'd be concerned about an infection of the allograft with um, a septic joint. Okay. So it looks like this is kind of an atypical fungal infection, and now they removed the allograft and Put a pin in. Oh. So, John, what's this? John? One, one problem, even with all this um, uh, all, all these uh, plates and, and screws, uh, you still may not get a fusion. Uh, that, that's one of the problems. And you're left with a hanging uh, shoulder, uh, which is uh, uh, no fun if you can imagine that. Okay. So this, uh, this this is a, a pretty sad sad case. Um, Thanks, John. By, by by the way, do you remember remember this one because you don't see these very often. Uh, a shoulder uh, fusion. And we, we don't um, use this equipment here. I don't, well, uh, not anymore, I don't think. Yeah. Ashley, what do you think of this one? Um, it looks like there's a lot of soft tissue thickening there on the radiograph uh, laterally um, adjacent to the humerus. And then you can see maybe there's a, there's a fluid, uh, kind of uh, complex fluid um, extending uh, along that humeral shaft and humeral head. And here you could see it's it's an enhancing um, collection there and it's, it's a lot of synovial thickening and there's actually a, looks like a, tra uh, a, a traction, uh, sinus tract uh, superiorly extending and uh, this is concerning for a pretty bad infection and abscess formation and septic joint. Yeah, this was all tuberculous bursitis. And a tip off the fact that this patient is alive is that that it's two months old. Um, uh, if it was a bacterial infection, i.e., Staph aureus or 
uh, strep or, or some other bacteria, um, this patient wouldn't be alive. So uh, you have to think of um, tuberculosis and um, other organisms I like it. Okay. So, Michael. All right. So, I guess we we'll start with the history. Shoulder resting pain, weakness, remote onset a year ago, recent onset five months. There's pain, limited range of motion. Um, okay. So, we see abnormal signal throughout pretty much the entirety of the rotator cuff. It's kind of enlarged and edematous. And there's maybe some atrophy as well. Hmm. Yeah, so it's yeah, fatty atrophy, or it's hard to tell if, yeah, it's fatty atrophy and increased signal. Did you say some, some atrophy? <laughs> no, I didn't, I said there's fatty atrophy. Oh, so okay. I'd be afraid that this is like denervation with atrophy and edema. Okay. And I guess now they're doing nerve studies. Yep. And so oh, post poliomyelitis syndrome. This is cool. Never seen that. Well, now you know. So if we go back again here, what what you really see is uh, these are T1 weighted and This is extensive fatty atrophy of all of these. Uh, of, of these muscles uh, around the rotator cuff. So you have to think about something that, that would cause that. And it turns out that it's, it's very focal just to these, uh, these muscles. The other muscles are still in pretty good shape. And this just happened to be that uh, polio just affected uh, the innervation here. And that's, uh... It used to be a common disease. Um, fortunately, we do we see any anymore, John? Uh, Not, I'm, I haven't heard of a case. Uh, uh, there are no new cases, and I think the only there are only two countries in the world where there's still new cases of polio. It's almost eradicated throughout the world. One is Afghanistan, and I think uh, it might be Pakistan. But outside of those two countries, there is no poliomyelitis in the world. Sock, sock and Sabin took care of that problem. Yeah. Um, we, we have to give them a lot, a lot of credit. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, my uncle suffered. That, from my, that was, uh, I, I, I had a share in treating these um, yeah. kids, uh, and, and, and it's a miserable disease. Yeah, it would be completely eradicated if it weren't for the political problems in those two countries. Uh, yeah. Um, war. Michael, did you do the last one? Yes, but I can do another one if you want. Yeah. All right, so 65-year-old female with well-defined arithmetic nodules on the right arm for one year. Um, so. Again, we can see some intermediate signal intensity material or nodules in the subcutaneous tissue along the right shoulder. Um, so I'd be concerned about some type of atypical infection. I know this can happen with sporotrichosis, migrating around the body. Um, There's sparginosis. Okay. It's, a, it's a basically a worm disease in some uh, uh, Asian countries. This happens to be South Korea. Uh, so it's a tapeworm infection. First described in 1882. Okay, Ashu. Okay, so this is a 58-year-old female with severe shoulder pain for two months during two hours after a flu shot high on the shoulder. And it looks like, I don't know what they, oh. 
uh, 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 that shot was misspelled, John. What do you mean misspelled? Oh, uh, you just fixed it. I just fixed it, right. Yeah. Uh, on the shoulder. So, um, well, it looks like they looks like there was a tear of the rotator cuff. Uh, right there, the supraspinatus looks torn, and there's a lot of edema within the subacromial subdeltoid bursa and extends into the joint. And um, could just be some inflama infl inflammation, although it looks in somewhat intact so there, but it looks like. This is I think they injected years. into the cuff. This is three years before, and this is what it is now. Okay. And there's what it is now, or at, at this time. Yeah, this is, they probably injected into the, the, the tendon, and this is all in, inflammatory uh, uh, re reaction to the injection being in the wrong place. That's an interesting place to inject, isn't it? Yeah, it's way too high. That's not too and high. into the bursa. Right, exactly. Yeah. So you got to be. If you guys give shots, which most radiologists don't. Yeah. So uh, that, that that must have been extremely painful. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Michael. Okay, so T1 weighted image. We're looking at probably I guess the deltoid muscle. Yeah. Uh, I don't see anything too crazy on the stir. It looks like there's actually diffuse, kind of diffusely increased signal throughout the entire muscle. Um, it enhances and striated. So, and now it looks enlarged on the T1 facet pre. And there's just kind of this irregular edema throughout the muscle. Yeah, so you really don't see much without contrast. No. Unless you see this kind of reticulum. So we have kind of nonspecific edema and enhancement in the deltoid muscle, which could either be like a myositis, potentially. Yeah, that's dermatomyositis. Good. Uh, that dermis, um, is, is that the swelling, John? Um, or is that fat? I don't I don't. I think the... Uh, on, on axial views, there, there, there's a... Um, yeah, I think all the pathology is in the muscle. I think the septicinous... No, I mean, uh, uh, above the muscle, um, is that fat or is it um, fat, some other... Fat suppressors, fat right along here. This is all muscle in here. This is fat up here. Okay. okay. Jennifer. Okay, so this is just diffuse symmetric muscle edema throughout all of the proximal muscles. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is probably another type of denervation neuropathy. Um, Juvenile dermatomyositis. Yeah. And dermatomyositis is usually symmetric. Uh, and uh, you get this edematous pattern and then eventually atrophy of the muscles. Okay. Ashu? Um, here we can see some soft tissue swelling, I think. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. And uh, looking here, oh, there's some low signal on the right. Um, Density. Yeah, right adjacent to this scapular border here. Um, just, it's, and it's definitely somewhat asymmetric there. Musculature is more developed there. Yeah, so much more low signal on that side versus this side. You can worry about possible um, infection. Um, uh, the T2 is so nice, you can see um, a lot more increased signal in that muscle belly. The supraspinatus. Um, and some in the deltoid. 
And so, yeah, I just looking at the post contrast images, it's actually not okay. And this is um, a bone scan. Wow, it's, just, uh, it's not as well seen here, but uh, I guess, yeah, there's, there's more uptake along that right delta. So, okay, so uh, elevated CK and mild, and it's definitely not a cardiac process. So, um, it, it, it could just be rhabdom. Okay. Yeah, that's rhabdomyolysis. Yeah. When, when you say elevated, um, it's not a little elevated, is it? Very elevated. No, it's, it's in the thousands, yeah. Way too high. It's, it's almost goodbye, Mr. Chips, elevated. Yeah. Right. Okay, uh, Michael. Okay, so 49 year old with pain on methotrexate and prednisone, no fever or chills. Um, so there's kind of a lot of edema fluid signals surrounding the the shoulder. Um, it looks like it's at least somewhat intramuscular involving the teres minor. Um, there's a lot of synovial thickening as well. So I'm wondering if this is some sort of reaction to methotrexate that I can't think of. Yeah. Because yeah, if it said no fever, no chills, yeah, it's you know, fasciitis. It wouldn't be localized if it was a reaction with it. Yeah. I don't know. Unless it was, was an injection of some kind. Yeah, right. So that this is obviously a, an inflammatory reaction with a lot of eosinophils. So. Okay. Yeah, we have a single axial image of the shoulder. I see. I can't tell if this is an arthrogram or if this is just joint, joint fluid. There is some fluid signal intensity along the deltoid muscle. Because it could be a focal abscess or inflammation. Um, okay, so it's not the, okay, so just some focal inflammation along the deltoid muscle, and, and this was after surgery, you can see that there's a big, uh, this was a big arthroscopic portal that uh, communicated with the joint space when they did the arthrogram, the fluid uh, the contrast went out through the arthroscopic portal into the deltoid muscle here. So. Okay, well, why don't we stop here, and uh, we'll start a, a new topic up on Monday, okay? Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend, everyone. Have a good weekend, everyone. Yep.